We are all familiar with the RVs of today. We own our own RVs in different classes. Some of us remember back to the 60s when the family loaded up into the car and went camping in a pop-up tent or a small travel trailer. But what about before that? The 50s, the 40s, the 30s, and earlier. Although RVing is accepted and popular now, it was a rocky road for our forebears when RVs were met with suspicion and derision. Welcome to Snowbirds and RV Travelers, the weekly show for RV enthusiasts where we talk about parks, activities, travel tips, trends, reviews, and the latest news affecting your RV experience. For more content and guest opportunities, head over to rvpodcast.com. That's rvpodcast.com. Today's show was written by Andrew Woodmansey. RVs have played an important role in our leisure history, emerging as a curious form of personal transportation despite suspicion and mild derision in the late 19th century. The first horse-drawn RVs were not invented. Instead, they evolved over many years as hybrids of other vehicles, including gypsy vardos, living vans, and even bathing machines. Contrary to popular belief, gypsies were not the first to use horse-drawn caravans. It was roving circus and menagerie owners who started using mobile accommodation in Europe during the 1800s. In the 19th century, recreation was a new social concept for those who could afford not to work. So the first RVs of the late 1800s were owned and enjoyed by the wealthy. The Gentleman Gypsies of Britain, led by Scotsman Dr. Gordon Stables in The Wanderer in 1885, used the first purpose-built RVs. They commissioned heavy horse-drawn wagons built by railway car manufacturers that were slow and uncomfortable. The first RVs were steam-drawn coaches of France that were built for royalty and well-to-do tourists in 1896. They weighed up to 10 tons and could only travel on roads next to rivers or canals so their steam boilers could be refilled. Passengers would travel in a separate coach behind a steam tractor to reduce the risk of injury from exploding boilers. When automobiles arrived at the start of the 20th century, they were not powerful enough to tow anything, let alone make it over poor roads. So good trucks that were converted into camp cars became the first motorhomes, mostly used by hunters. They were noisy, smelly, unreliable, and inflexible. Despite many attempts to combine engine and accommodations into a single vehicle, the generally unpopular motorhome did not sell in any numbers until the arrival of the Volkswagen Combi in the 1950s. In North America, settlers had to travel long distances along poor trails. Reliability took precedence over comfort. The significance of covered wagons as ancestors of the North American RV is overstated since they were designed to carry goods far from comfortable and consequently rarely used as mobile accommodations. However, it was the ambulance wagon that first influenced a number of design features of the first horse-drawn RVs. The self-built houses on wheels, seen in towns across North America in the 1890s, often adopted flat floors, soft springs, and the box shape of the ambulance wagon to convey their peacetime occupants. Converted ambulance wagons were used by so-called health seekers to escape consumption outbreaks, tuberculosis, on North America's east coast in the mid to late 19th century. Is history repeating itself today? The McMaster camping car of 1889, probably North America's first purpose-built horse-drawn RV, used design elements of both the ambulance wagon and the herdic carriage. At the start of the motorized era, North American newspaper reporters in the early 1900s were dazzled by large RVs, including the long wheelbase Pierce Arrow Turing Landau of 1910 and Roland P. Conklin's double-decker gypsy van of 1915, but these were cumbersome anomalies. The first significant RV movement in North America was led by the tent trailer from about 1911. Towed by a Ford Model T, the tent trailer was both affordable and flexible and could reach lakes, forests, and newly established national parks with little difficulty. They were manufactured in the thousands and used by working families to enjoy a few days of camping each year. Motorhomes still tried to compete. 
the camping autos of the 1920s produced by de Bretville, Lamsteed, Zegelmeyer, and others used ingenious folding or sliding mechanisms but were complex and expensive compared to tent trailers. House cars had some success but were still a niche product. Meanwhile, North American roads were improving and automobiles were becoming more powerful, paving the way for the travel trailer to become the successor to the tent trailer in the 1930s. The first post-World War I travel trailers in the UK were made from surplus aircraft parts. This trend continued in North America from about 1930, and the first manufacturers dismantled just about anything that once moved in order to make rudimentary travel trailers. Self-built trailers competed strongly against established manufacturers, forcing costs down. Salesmen knew, and still know today, that it was fancy looking appliances that sold RVs and used low cost materials like timber, masonite, and canvas to frame their trailers, which they then filled with more visible home comforts, including stoves, fridges, bathrooms, and toilets. As travel trailers became more obese, double axles were introduced and the slide out soon followed. In contrast, travel trailers using the lightweight designs and materials of the aircraft industry were pioneered by Glenn Curtis, Holly Bolas, and Wally Byam, but were initially expensive to build. From 1930, the streamlining fad took hold of the industry, and canned ham trailers became popular for a time. However, manufacturers preferred the toaster shape of trailers since they were quicker to build, could contain more features, and were easily used for business by traveling salesmen. Recreational fifth wheel trailers, first developed in Belgium in 1913, were produced by Curtis, among others, in the form of his sophisticated aero car, which unfortunately arrived at the peak of the Great Depression and were too expensive for most consumers. Today, there are more RV models and styles than ever, with good roads and more powerful engines in North America facilitating some of the world's largest RVs. To quote naturalist John Burroughs when describing the expeditions of the four vagabonds in 1920, he said, It often seemed to me that we were a luxuriously equipped expedition going forth to seek discomfort. One hundred years later, with the advent of the weight-sensitive fully electric RV just around the corner, RVers may need to consider taking fewer or lighter comforts on the road. History would suggest that the teardrop trailer has a bright future. Andrew Woodmansey is the author of a new RV history called Recreational Vehicles, A World History, 1872 to 1939, published in hardback by Pen and Sword and available at all good bookshops. Andrew also has a blog at rvhistory.com. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed it, share it with your friends. And if you'd like to hear more, please follow or subscribe. Your opinions are important. So please take a moment to share your ideas, comments on this show, or topics you'd like us to cover. For fun contests and picture submissions, check out our Instagram channel at Snowbirds RV Travelers. Snowbirds and RV Travelers is a Sun Cruiser Media production.